Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Students Talk with you about empathetic teaching. This is the all, um, final uh, session in our series, Students uh, Talk with You series. Um, and uh, if in an ideal world, we probably would have had this one uh, kick things off because it's really the one that inspired the whole um, series. But we did want to have it um, happen during. Um, design forward the care and equity module, which is why we kind of saved it for last. Um, but I'm so pleased um, to welcome our uh, three of our collab student affiliates um, who uh, will introduce themselves in a moment. Um, getting a little bit ahead of myself, my name is Hannah Hounsel. I'm the learning advisor for the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative, um, and I'm the supervisor for the um, collab student affiliates but uh, they were the masterminds behind um, this session and I am just a facilitator. <laughs> and uh, our goal today is definitely to encourage like some open dialogue about these um, topics. Um, our students and I have devised some questions to kind of guide us, um, but I completely welcome anybody who wants to, to unmute or to raise their hand if they have follow-up questions um, to the questions that I will um, start us off with. And then at the end, I definitely welcome um, folks to uh, ask their own questions of our students. And students, feel free to ask your own questions of our faculty and staff and other participants here. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna kick things off. Um, First things first is I will have our students introduce themselves, um, their name, their major, their year, and a little bit about um, what kind of inspired them to um, talk about this subject and create this session. And I think I'll kick it off with Natalie. Natalie's okay with that? Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm Natalie Smith. I'm a junior here at Plymouth State majoring in accounting. Um, and most of my motivation for joining in on this session comes from the fact that I do have chronic illness and empathy is something that is very important to me in the world and especially in my education. Thanks, Nat. I'll throw it to Cassidy next. All right. Hi, my name is Cassidy. I'm a senior here at Plymouth State and a communication media studies major. Um, I really wanted to kind of join this session because I've seen how empathy can change the lives of students. So it's really something that has a lot of meaning to me. And last but not least, Shelby. Hi, I'm Shelby Goodell Spooner. Um, I am a sophomore in interdisciplinary studies. And I chose um, this topic because like Natalie and Cassie both said, um, it's been a huge part of um, my academic success, and I think it's really important. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Um, and to provide just a little bit of context, um, right now, um, the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative is running dis, um, the module of Design Forward called uh, Care and Equity. So we've been talking all about the subject of um, approaching our teaching with care and um, our students were really interested in talking about um, empathizing with students and approaching the um, teaching experiences with empathy for students. So um, to kick us off, uh, our students actually wanted to talk a little bit about empathy for our teachers. Um, and so the very first question is, um, at a time where all of us um, are experiencing some level of burnout as the semester winds down, um, I'm thinking that a lot of folks are feeling burnout from care as well. Um, and I wanted to ask our students, how um, do you care for others and yourself at the same time? And how might you suggest um, your teachers kind of approach self-care as well? And I think I'm uh, turning it over to Natalie to start us off. Yeah, um, so, you know, this time in this crazy weird world we've been living in, it's burnout has been something that I've dealt with a lot and I'm sure everyone here has. And I think setting boundaries between for yourself and for your um, communications with others is the most important thing. Setting that time to care for yourself, realizing when you can ask for help and when you need to kind of leave a situation. And also understanding that 
when you're asking for help, there's another person on the other end of that. And that person is also dealing with their own things. And I think creating a space where you can help other people while you help yourself is really important in making sure that you don't exacerbate anyone else's burnout that they might be feeling. Um, I know for myself personally that something I've always struggled with is asking for help and learning when I can ask for help. So I think setting those boundaries for yourself and with your faculty is something that is, should really be worked on a lot. Thanks, Matt. Um, Cassidy, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Um, yeah. So in this panel, we're really aiming to also um, be empathetic towards you guys as well. Um, kind of like as Natalie said, the past few years have been absolutely crazy. Um, burnout is very, very real. And we recognize that, you know, it goes both ways. So students and faculty are feeling really just kind of at the end of the road. So. Um, and I gotta say, as um, we were having our planning meeting um, together, the students and I, and Cassidy kicked off the whole conversation by being like, um, you know, I don't want the uh, faculty to feel like we are making demands at them. We're like, we're approaching the conversation by being like, you must do this <laughs> in order for us to feel like you care about us. Um, and I just loved that. And we all decided that we wanted this to kind of kick off our conversation um, because that's the beautiful thing about empathy is that it goes both ways um, and care work isn't possible unless you are also cared for. Um, so I just love the reciprocity kind of um, that really started this whole conversation among our students. Um, so I'm really grateful to them for that. Um, before I move on, would I would love to invite anybody to kind of um, unmute or ask any follow-up questions um, or talk about uh, self-care, caring for yourself, um, even as you care for other people. I have absolutely nothing to say about self-care, but, but I will say um, we were reading something in Design Forward and we were talking somewhere, um, but this made me think about it, about Plymouth State's commitment to sustainability, you know, particularly in terms of like environment and green initiatives. But I've been thinking more about how we maybe integrate care into that because there is such conversation in people who like study and talk about care about sustainability, right? And that's what, like when we talk about burnout, it's so similar to like burning through environmental resources. Um, so really what we're talking about is like not how to use up scarce resources, but really how to create cycles, right? Where people, where things are regenerated. Um, it just seemed like we could do something cool with the ecosystem of care when we're also thinking about all of our green initiatives. I love that, Robin. Um, I'm thinking like a graph, like <laughs> in my mind, I picture like a graphic, like design something with like the recycle, <laughs> but it's like care. <laughs> yeah, Nick, do you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm zooming in from my office. Is my audio okay? Come through, okay? Okay, cool. Okay. So I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna throw a uh, Spectrum News article in the chat, which uh, covers a lot of autistic activism. Um, uh, I could go on for entirely too long about how empathy used in a cognitive science context is problematic in, in realms of like neurodiversity, especially autism. But uh, Damian Milton, who is an autistic researcher who uh, focuses on uh, um, uh, cognitive and intellectual disabilities, has talked about the, the double empathy problem, which is the notion that communication can uh, it, with autistic and non-autistic people, communication can break down when there's not empathy present on both sides. As Hannah just says, empathy's got to go both, both ways. And as somebody else said about like setting boundaries and knowing when to withdraw from a situation, that was also a great comment. Like, um, I think a lot of the mainstream rhetoric about empathy is so much about sort of like empathy is just going to like magically fix the world and forgets all the hard bits. And two of those hard bits that 
have already been mentioned and that I just really want to underline are that like it's a two-way street. It involves both parties and some situations um, are just sort of like if you are the, if you are the only person engaged in uh, in empathy in a situation, sometimes that's just a recipe for burnout and for um, for um, uh, moral injury, which is a new term, uh, new to me term that I've heard thrown around as an alternative to burnout, that that sort of makes it seem less like a self problem and more like a system problem. Yeah, as Robin says, or abuse. But yeah, check out Damian Milton. This works fantastic. Yeah, thanks for that, Nick. Um, I love that phrase. I want to hold on to that phrase. What is it? Moral burnout or moral? I believe it was moral injury. Moral injury. Thank moral you. injury as a, as a, as an alternative to burnout that focuses on how, like, as Robin puts, like, burnout is often caused by abuse, and calling yeah. that burnout minimizes actually the harm that's done. Mm. Yeah, Martha, go ahead. I just wanted to jump in because, um, you know, with the the conversations we've been having with Design Forward, we've been doing a lot of talking about what the meanings of these words, and I think that a lot of the um, the, the complications co come about based on how we interpret these words and how we um, and and how we choose to use them, and and the reason I kind of say that is. It, I've been struggling a lot with sort of care, what care means. It can mean so many different things within the, the care and equity module. And I think empathy is, is one of the words that is often um, used to stand in for care in these contexts. But the word that I keep coming back to, and it's a difficult word, and I've talked about it before, and I think lots of people kind of shy away from using it in an educational context for really good reasons. But the word I keep, there's a reason I keep coming back to it is the word love. And the reason I keep coming back to love is because I think that we do have a certain understanding of love as being ideally a reciprocal relationship. And so we, in the in in the ideal circumstances when we love somebody it doesn't drain us it um has the potential to revitalize us and um and we approach it without this whereas care i think sometimes when we approach the word care we think of it as as giving away as opposed to entering into um and so i just think Problem, like problematizing these words, unpacking these words a little bit, including empathy is really, really important. And, and maybe some of where we get to a place where we feel less drained is by approaching the care work with a, a slightly different mindset. Um, and I'm not saying that's as simple as just like flipping a switch in our heads, but if we, if we kind of can train ourselves to care in a, in, in a way that feels reciprocal, and less, less like a giving away of ourselves and a more like an entering into something with people um, that potentially that can be really powerful. Yeah, Ali, go on. One thing that, <clears throat> sorry, one thing that keeps popping into my mind as I think about these words is um, the word communication. Um, and I think that's because uh, we, in one of the one of the things we were uh, connecting with in our program that we're doing right now through the CPLC is, you know, whether how you show love to your students and whether or not they can show love to you and all of those kinds of things. And I shared in one of my responses something about um, I, I really share a lot with my students about my own personal life. Um, you know, of course, there are boundaries, not. But you know, I do. I share. Um, I've got a lot going on in my family, and I, I share that with them. Um, and I find that it, they it starts to kind of normalize, maybe that that these are things or these kinds of things happen to everybody in their life. And I think if we were able to more freely talk about them because they are more normal, then we would all be able to empathize and interact in such a more healthy way and it wouldn't be like i've got this secret this thing is happening to me and it's really really bad and now i need somebody to take care of me because i've let it bubble up so hard and um so i think that communication 
opening communication and normalizing things that are going on in life and normalizing talking nicely to people and reaching out to others. I don't think that's as normal as you think, um, unfortunately. And I think that, you know, I think communication is going to be a big key for that and making it more normalized. And I think it would help a lot. I think this is an absolutely perfect segue into one of our questions. Uh, students, I'm going to skip around just a tiny bit. Um, because one of the questions that we kind of came up with was, um, how can you tell if a teacher cares about you? And what does care look like in assignments, in the syllabus, during conversations, et cetera? Um, and Shelby, um, when we were talking, you brought up the CPLC. Um, do you wanna answer Ali a little bit and talk about that experience? Yeah. Um, so my experience with the CPLC, like especially the um, the first like kind of in-person one for me, um, it was a very eye-opening experience for me being able to see um, like the transparency and knowing that um, like we had talked about it quite a bit, how um, like it's much easier for, I feel, students to connect with um, professors when they are more open and you can see that um, like students aren't the only ones who are struggling, like the teachers are really putting in the effort and, um, and just being able to see that um, kind of <clears throat> process is, um, really helpful being able to see okay my teachers are really trying to um make this easier they're not trying to make my life hard <laughs> um and like just being able to see that you know professors are humans too they're not like um they're working through things just like we are and um so that's that was a really um new experience for me and it like gave me a whole different view um so it's definitely like changed my perspective um quite a bit since that experience yeah it's like a simultaneous like seeing how the sausage is made and also realizing that teachers have a hard time making the sausage that's an awful metaphor that kind of grossed me out halfway through it but <laughs> <laughs> you guys kind of get my gist, right? <laughs> Thanks, Shelby. Um, did, uh, Natalie or Cassidy, did you want to jump in with kind of additional observations about um, how you can tell a teacher kind of cares about you, um, you know, in different aspects? Yeah, of course. One thing I've noticed that really makes students a lot more comfortable is those when you first sit down in a class and you get that syllabus, seeing that carbon copy, same exact thing, it doesn't give you any real information about who the people are, is, it feels very sterile. Um, I've had that happen in a lot of classes and I've noticed the classes that I feel most comfortable in where I feel like there is a level of communication is I've had teachers give us resumes. I've had them spend a good 40 minutes telling us about what they do outside of work, about their family. And I think, making those small detail oriented things be a little less sterile can really make a large impact on the comfortability of both students and teachers. I feel like opening up that line of communication really early can be beneficial. I love that. And um, this kind of brought us into talking about syllabi and like the importance of the first day of class. Um, really brought like us to life in our planning meeting. Um, and I think Cassidy, you had something really interesting to say, or Shelby, I can't remember which one. <laughs> Either one, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, I know we talked a little bit about like teachers who are really, really harsh during like the first day of class. They're like, you're going to fail this class, like 40% of you and like how that's terrifying. Um, and that just does not set anyone up for success. 
Um, another thing I found really, really helpful going into a class on the first day is like inquiring about the students' lives, um, finding out like why they're taking the course, because not everyone's there simply because they have to or because, you know, they're working towards a major. Some people want to pick up a new skill. So I always find that really, really beneficial. Thanks. I'm trying to remember who said it, but someone was like, yeah, I had an experience where the first thing a teacher said was X, Y, Z. And then I, yeah, Shelby, you're, <laughs> um, I had, you don't uh, have to like reveal any like identifications or anything. No, I won't. You said that and I was like, oh my God. Yeah. My, it was like one of my first classes, my freshman year, my professor was like 40% of you are going to fail. And like, that's, a rough thing to hear as a freshman, like your one of your first college classes. And so it was kind of like a immediate wall was put up like, okay, I'm not going to do well in this class. Um, so like Cassidy and Natalie had talked about like, um, those first few classes are like, um, at least for me having um, classes where the teachers do introductions and make an effort to have like people get to know each other and getting to know the professor and versus classes that just like jump right in and do the syllabus and like there aren't they're not trying to really make those connections it can be really hard to um, connect better with those teachers versus the ones who are like putting in the effort to get to know you and um, letting you get to know them too. Oh, really well said. I think this was just like one of my major aha moments with talking with you guys, because I mean, maybe in the back of my head, I always knew like those first moments of a class, you know, kind of set the tone, but um, just talking with you guys made me realize just how important um, those kind of first words that come out of the teacher's mouth are. Um, before we move on to the next question, would uh, anybody else like to unmute and um, talk or ask questions or anything like that. Uh, Martha, I loved what you said about the teaching statement. Did you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I just mentioned that this is an activity in the um, design forward workbook that we included for this module. And I really think, I mean, I don't know how it'll go. I'm kind of interested to see what it's like um, for faculty to think about writing a, a version of their teaching statement that's aimed at their students for an audience. But the other thing that I keep coming back to is this word that I use all the time when I'm talking to faculty and, and when I'm talking about teaching, which is, um, and then, and sometimes I, I do, and I'm like, maybe we should stop and talk about what that actually means, which is this idea of transparency um, and like transparent pedagogy and what it means to be transparent with students about, um, about how we teach, but also about who we are. And I think a lot of what we're circling around here is about um, embracing a certain kind of transparency, recognizing that like, you know, we do have to have some boundaries, um, that that's important as well. That's part of maintaining a healthy community. Um, but I've been thinking for a while that I'd like to do a workshop in the collab, maybe next, next fall about um, what transparent teaching actually is. Um, and I'm curious whether other people would find that interesting because I think um, like really trying to pin down what some of those practice, like what that practically looks like in the classroom, like what does it mean to be transparent on your syllabus? How could a teaching statement for your students be a transparent practice? Um, how do you design assignments and present them to students in ways that feel transparent? Um, I, I just feel like there's a lot there for us to explore that would help get it at some of what we're talking about here. Want us to do that workshop you should let me know <laughs> you should do that workshop martha <laughs> is that all it takes is me saying um thank you for continuing to bring up like the, how, how the words that we use you know as we're talking about these things um matter too um and i i wonder a lot with transparency and boundaries um how many of those that we we maintain one, because it's the status quo and it's how things quote unquote have always been done. Um, but also two, um, this idea of like professionalism and how we're supposed to, you know, um, 
what we should be doing in order to maintain like a level of professionalism or um, for uh, faculty of color and for um, uh, faculty who are uh, re um, identify as women. And I think can relate to this idea of needing to maintain those boundaries and kind of uh, in order to be respected almost. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely more complicated than, um, you know, be transparent, bye. <laughs> and so I really think a workshop or a discussion kind of really looking into transparency and, um, you know, how complicated of a, of a concept it is would be absolutely fantastic. I'm just giving a pause to make sure. No one else wants to speak. Yeah, I, that's this is really making um, me think a lot about um, my experiences as a student in the past, and um, you know, I'll be a new faculty member in the fall, teaching my first course here in PSU. But you know, thinking about my my line of work, um, I'm a clinical social worker, a therapist, and so. When I think about empathy, right, it's something that I seek in all relationships in my life, um, in all spheres. And it's something that's really important to me in my clinical work, right, with my clients. And also, right, I think it's really important, like transparency and empathy go hand in hand. And they have to, transparency has to be present in order to, I think, really like do empathy well. For it to be felt. Um, and yeah, like there's so many um, times in which, right, like it may not, yeah, like pro professionalism can really get in the way of this. Um, and so I think about, you know, like the way that I kind of reframe it in my mind is, you know, how being really intentional about how we're performing, performing, how we're like doing empathy, how we're doing transparency in this process um, very intentionally so that it serves, right? Like the purpose that we're trying, right? Trying to, to get to, right? Like trying to create um, a positive, welcoming, um, like open space, right? Within the classroom, physical or not, right? Um, and which I, I really do think, and this is obviously like a big point here is it does create like a more ideal learning environment, right? Where you don't have to have your defense up all the time, right? That only really holds us back, um, in so many ways. So I'm spiraling out, but yeah. Thanks Libby. Lots there. Um, and, uh, it's again, a perfect segue kind of into the next kind of question that we, um, that the students came up with um, of actually the next two questions. So I'm kind of grouping them together a bit, um, FYI students. Um, the first one is uh, how do you reach out um, when you need help and how could a professor encourage students to reach out? Um, and also what are some barriers in students asking for help? So either, you know, in your experience, um, Nat, Shelby and Cassidy, what has stopped you from reaching out for help? Um, and also what have you observed kind of in your, um, you know, peers or friends, um, what has stopped them from reaching out as well? Um, Cassidy, do you wanna kick off conversation? Absolutely. So um, asking for help can be incredibly daunting for some students. I've definitely been there myself. Um, I think coming into college, I was a little more scared of my professors than I am now, I should say. I was a lot more scared of my professors than I am now. <laughs> um, so I definitely, I used to hesitate to like ask questions. I'd like find like the most unnoticeable way to do it. Um, cause you know, when you're a wee human, a wee adult, if you will, um, you know, you're kind of picturing yourself like down here and your professors are up here. Like they're so smart and you're just, you know, 
scum you're not but you know that's how I thought <laughs> not saying that's correct but you know some students do kind of come in with that mentality um so kind of like finding ways to deconstruct that perception of like well obviously there is power dynamics within a classroom but kind of making it so people can not be scared to ask you things because they feel stupid or because they feel like they're not supposed to. Yeah, and um, Cassidy, when you brought this up during our planning meeting, you talked about, or we talked about rather, I think I might've put um, the actual term in your mouth, um, of like power dynamics in the classroom mm -hmm. um, and kind of the ways that um, perhaps uh, we can flip the power dynamics a little bit um and you know we talked we related transparency um to kind of breaking down those power dynamics and like the traditional hierarchical um you know lecture <laughs> um position that sometimes uh faculty can take on or traditional teaching um is based around and um we I'm trying to remember what else we talked about. Um, we, we kind of connected it to some of the ideas around open education too, um, like encouraging students to be part of, you know, the design process for a class or um, to be contributors to the knowledge instead of just um, it being transactional. So we, we talked a, bit, a little bit about that as well. And um, Matt, did you wanna add anything else? Yeah, um, when it comes to asking for help, something that I know I struggled with a lot and I'm sure a lot of other people have is the guilt and the shame of it. Um, I know for me personally, growing up, I was someone who never asked for help. I never asked for help in school, in my personal life. It was just something that I never had to get used to until I came to school, I got sick, and then I didn't know how. I felt guilty for missing class. I felt ashamed for not being able to get myself through the day. And which I know now that I shouldn't, um, it's definitely taken a lot of growth. And I know a lot of students go through that same thing. They feel like they aren't working hard enough that they just need to push themselves harder when really they are doing everything they can. And that guilt and the shame gets in the way of them being able to go to their professors and let them in on the fact that, you know, they are doing their best and that they just need a little bit of help. Yeah, not so great. And um, the guilt and shame that it's not just a one and done with asking for help. You have to do it over and over and over again. I remember that feeling very well as a student being like, why do I have to keep asking for help all the time? <laughs> like, why can't I just like do this on my own? And also the feeling that you had to earn the ability to ask for help too. We talked a little bit about this um, during our planning meeting, um, which I know I keep bringing up, but I, God, I wish I had recorded that, honestly. Um, the feeling that you need to have an established relationship with a faculty member, or you need to prove yourself by turning in amazing work, or you need to meet all the deadlines in order to earn the right to ask for an extension or ask for a deadline uh, or um, request help um, and that being kind of the barrier for for asking for it. Um, Cassidy, there's a awesome question um, in the chat if you want to talk about that a little bit um, from Scott about are there ways that faculty unconsciously uh, reinforce that power dynamic and um, anybody else can unmute to to talk about that Nat and yeah. Um, I'd love to talk about that. So kind of like we were talking about, first impressions are, are huge. Um, so if you walk into a classroom and the professor is very much like, some of you are going to fail, um, don't be that student. It sets up this dynamic with like, okay, so he already expects us to fail. Um, we're like already, you know, kind of lesser than him, that or she, they, that person. <laughs> There's also a lot of preconceived ideas of what college is like when you walk in as a freshman. Um, we're kind of talking about this 
um, in one of the design forward readings. Um, I think Robin mentioned something about it, but um, a lot of students are told like, your professors, they don't want to deal with you. You're going to be in this massive lecture hall. Like it's going to be hard to get in contact with them. So that also kind of sets it up like, okay, well, I'm on my own. They don't want to hear from me. If they hear from me, I'm going to bother them. So that also, you're kind of working against those. And I understand that's out of a lot of, out of the power of a lot of professors. Um, but it's just something to kind of keep in mind when you're especially working with new students that that might already be something they're thinking of. Um, another thing is just like not making yourself available. I've had professors who are like, don't ever email me. This is you have one way of contacting me. This is the only way. Um, and like. I understand that to some extent. Like, obviously, we need to set up boundaries so, you, you know, you have space and time away from your students. That's really important. Um, but at the same time, when those, like, boundaries are so strict that it limits students from contacting you and actually figuring out how to ask for help, it almost sets up this um, unspoken idea that, like, I don't want to deal with you. Um, so, yeah. That's all I, that's all I have. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Allie. One of my colleagues and I have um, <clears throat> gone around and around about this, and um, we were talking about a power dynamic with our students. And um, when he joined us, one of the things that he um, really believed in was going by his first name. And he wanted the students to call him his, by his first name. And um, so he started having, um, going by his first name and referring everybody by their first name and all of that. And we kind of didn't have a conversation about it as a team. And um, so, so when we started having a conversation, it became, you know, we started thinking, well, does a title uh, create a power um, struggle between the students and the teacher, or is it really the other stuff and what you're called doesn't matter. And, um, I've struggled with it quite a bit and um, I've actually talked to other colleagues and one of the things that comes to my mind is um, I have always, my students have always told me that I'm approachable and they, they care about me and I care about them and we have a great relationship and they always call me by my title. And um, so my defense is, I don't, I, I don't think that that's the only thing. I don't think that that's the barrier. And I also think we should model for students that like, if they've earned something or if they, if, if, if there is something about them that creates a title for them, it shouldn't be shameful to go by that either. Um, and I kind of wanted to know what you guys thought this US students has like calling your instructor by doctor or professor or any of those kinds of things reinforced that there is, um, uh, you know, there's a power dynamic with between the relationship, or is it more the relationship itself and the title hasn't come into mind for you? So in my personal experience, it is the relationship itself. I have professors who go by their first name. That's all I've ever called them. I have professors who request to be only called doctor for their official title. And I think, you know, you earned that, you get to be called that. I know that if I end up there, I might want to be called that. And I think it doesn't matter what you have your students refer to you as, as long as you are developing those connections. I know I've been in some classes where there have been a few times where someone has been demanded, they, we don't call them anything but doctor, and it's been understandable, but the way they convey themselves isn't the problem, it's that they aren't making those communications. And I've had professors that go by their first name, but they still aren't making those communications. It really is about that relationship you create with your students. Thank you so much for the feedback. I appreciate it. I'm bringing that to our next conversation. <laughs> I'm thinking a little bit about too, like um, it, it might matter how the professor handles when a student messes that up. Um, 
and I'm trying to remember back. I I am like a little biased because I was an English major here and literally everybody in the English department was like Anne and Paul and you know, so I had that kind of experience when I was a student. But obviously I had professors outside of outside of English. And I I do remember like a couple interactions that I witnessed with um faculty who um were uncomfortable with like the title that they were or being referred to by the first name by a student who maybe they were like kind of used to it in their department kind of like me um and being scared about like the way that it was handled and kind of making a note in my head of being like okay that's an that's a professor that I can't really approach I can't really make a mistake around um because they they took offense at that they you know, um, you know, reacted badly. So now I'm like kind of afraid to, you know, make a mistake on this essay or to ask this question during class. Um, so I know I'm not a student now, but um, definitely thinking about that a little bit. I'm wondering if um, you guys kind of agree with that or if that sounds familiar or if I'm way off base. It's definitely how they respond to it. Um... I, I had one teacher a few years ago who went by doctor and everyone called him doctor and he called all of us Mr. and Mrs. and Miss and that's how everything went in the class and one time someone called him professor um, and the response was not gentle at all <laughs> um, and that is what separated us it wasn't you know the title it was the response to you know feeling like you made that one little slip up and now you feel like you cannot go to that person. It's definitely the same way. I had a professor who um, like, if you didn't address him how he wanted, he wouldn't respond to your emails. So it was hard to like, like as a student to reach out. And if you like, it kind of put up another barrier where like, you wouldn't really want to reach out just in case, like, what if I made a mistake then to get help, to get the help that I need, I have to, like, it just puts more stress on reaching out to the professor. Um, so, yeah. Wow. This is making me think too about um, students who are automatically at a disadvantage in that situation too. So um student uh first generation students who maybe don't know the unspoken rules of um higher education or university that you know you should be careful about like um how you uh, address your professor or um students of color or students of diverse um backgrounds who like don't know these unspoken rules and how that automatically like puts them at a disadvantage in that class or with that professor um so thanks for bringing that up, Shelby. Yeah. Um, we are on our last question, I believe, unless I'm missing one. So please let me know if I'm missing one. Um, Hannah, Hannah yeah. sorry, this is this is Jennifer. Um, yeah, I just wanted to I just wanted to comment and um, on what Shelby was just saying about the professor that wouldn't respond to email if you didn't uh, address them properly. I just like, I mean, I feel like that needs to be called out as abusive. Um, that's, that's not okay. I mean, that's, it's, you know, the electronic equivalent of the silent treatment and, and that's not okay at all. So I'm sorry that that happened to you or to other students. There's a concept called, um, or not a concept, there's a book that some of my students are reading called One Trusted Adult. And that in an education um, system or, or um, setting, there should always be one, like hopefully you have that one person that you know you can go to, you know that you can trust whether it's your advisor or one of your faculty or whatever. And um, I would hope that um, she'll be like, if that happened again, I hope it never happens to anybody again, but something like that, that you would have that one trusted adult that you could say, I don't really know how to deal with this. You know, can you, can you help me? I don't get this. Um, because I have students come to me all the time that will, you know, ask me like when weird things like that are happening. And, and you know, um, I, I would look for a trusted adult if you can't. I know that sounds kind of like a corny name or whatever, but usually there's somebody that you connect with um, easily. So that's something I would suggest for the future. Let them help you navigate 
like such a horrible situation. I've, I've had uh, I've had two ascent students in the last year who came to me with a very similar issue. They they didn't address their instructor in the right way. They, their an, their emails were answered, but it was very very hostile in the response, and they were they were terrified. They were terrified to come talk to me for fear that I was going to go talk to the professor about it, and somehow that would damage their. Um, their relationship in the class. In the two cases that I had, had, it was the same professor though. So at least in my experience, it's not widespread, but it definitely has an impact on students. Yeah. Um, I, it, I don't wanna interrupt any good conversation happening. Um, so I'll give it a second if anybody else wants to raise their hand or unmute before we kind of move on to the last um, question that we have. I just I just want to say something that I, I think I've heard I probably beaten to death in the chat, but like hearing these stories, like this is what I would term educational trauma. And um these are this is stuff that every student carries into every classroom with them. And so it's all the more reason why transparency and relationships and empathy absolutely have to be centered because if you if we don't acknowledge that this is in the room with us and that and not only is it like it's not just Shelby's story like Shelby's one student in a class right if you look out at your class and you know half of them it's probably more but half of them have had it, a an experience like this either here or before they came to PSU they are holding that with them in every interaction and it's coloring how they're able to learn in your classroom um and I just cannot emphasize enough how just talking to students about this stuff is it's it's a it doesn't feel like it's a big step um and it's not the only step but it is the first step and it is enlightening um, and it really, it really can make a huge difference too. I'm sorry, Shelby, that's just awful. Yeah. It's that I think many of us, you know, as teachers come with some of this as well and not to make it all the same, right? Cause it's not, we all have individual experiences, but talking about like reducing burnout and things like that, making this sustainable. It can be so healing to provide that space to others, right? And to call it out as a thing that happens and that many of us have probably been through at some point in our educational history, right? Um, and so I think that can be like really like regenerative and like positively fueling. So um, the very last question um, was originally going to be the very first question, um, but we kind of went right into really great conversation. So um, I would love to invite our students to talk about um, some stories that stand out in their mind. We've already kind of touched on a few of them um, where that you about a time that you really needed empathy um, and you either got it or you didn't and how that kind of affected um, your academics. And um, I kind of encourage the students to end their stories with maybe some takeaways that um, faculty can bring with them or that you guys kind of brought with you um, in, into the next classroom or into the next learning experience. Um, I've kind of lost track of who went last. I, I'm trying to, <laughs> Shelby? No, Shelby went last, yes, Nat. You want to go first? Thanks. <laughs> I can do that. Um, my first semester here at PSU, I started to get diagnosed with endometriosis, and that plays a lot into the story. I was going to doctor's appointments almost three times a week, um, being put on a million different medications, and so I was missing a lot of class. And I had doctor's appointments and doctor's notes for all of my absences, and I was talking to my teachers. And one day I had to leave class because I was, I got really, really ill during it. And I pulled the teacher aside and I was like, hey, like, I'm sorry, I tried to be here, but like, I really need to go home. 
and she seemed fine with it. And I was like, I'm glad she understands. And two hours later, I got an email uh, from Campus Accessibility saying that I was, you know, abusing my absences and my illness. And it brought me so much more shame and guilt asking for help, talking to my teachers and taking care of myself. And I think if that professor had just talked to me, asked me what was going on, tried to open a line of communication before, you know, going right to the final step, um, things would have been a lot better. I ended up dropping that course and never taking a class with that professor again until this semester, which was terrifying. Um, and I think it was just something that if handled differently, could have really been a lot easier to handle for both me and the professor. And I know it's frustrating when someone misses classes. I know because it's frustrating for the students too. It's not, you know, a jolly good time. <laughs> um, and I think just, you know, talking to your students when something like that is going on instead of just going right past them is really, really important because, you know, you'll get that insight, especially when, you know, you know they're going through these things. Matt, I'm curious, do, um, the, uh, with the doctor's notes, is that something that has been communicated to you that you need to provide as the doctor's notes? Or is that something that you've kind of decided so, to do? I don't need doctor's notes. I have a permanent doctor's note, um, but I still give them when I'm doing really poorly because I am ashamed and I don't want professors to think I'm, you know, off, you know, at the beach having uh, some sort of grand jolly time. Um, and I know I shouldn't have to do that, but I do because I feel like I want them to understand that it's not just me, you know, off skipping around. Thanks, Matt. And I just also want to say to you, Matt, um, you know, thank you for being involved in this conversation and uh, being, you know, uh, trusting us enough to talk about these, you know, very real situations. This goes for all of our students. Um, and also, Nat, you never need to give me a doctor's note. <laughs> I know I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they tell me I have a doctor's note when they need to miss um, work, and I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I don't want your doctor's note. <laughs> I believe you every time. Um, Shelby, did you want to um, take it off next? Yeah, sure. Um, so kind of to piggyback off of um, my first experience, my second semester, my freshman year, um, I had a teacher who from the very beginning, she made it very clear that um, she was very flexible. She like encouraged students to reach out, out to her if she needed like if you needed anything, if you needed an extension, you knew that she was going to be flexible with you and work with you to like make a due date and give you the time that you needed to work through what you were going through and be able to get that assignment done on time. And um, so that made that experience um, a lot easier for me because I was never a student who, you know, reached out to get an extension or something like that. Um, but the one time that I did that semester, I was like, there was family stuff going on and I was like drowning in stress and assignments. And um, so I reached out to her and um, I think we even set up a Zoom meeting maybe and like made a whole plan about how I was gonna get that certain assignment done. And it just took an enormous amount of weight off my shoulders and I was able to get that assignment done on time and keep my grade up because I mean if I hadn't then um, I don't know if I would have even been able to get the assignment done or you know do it to the best um, of my ability that I could have um, so that definitely kind of it put down that barrier I guess and like encouraged me to reach out more um, yeah, so it made it um, 
a lot easier for me to now communicate with my professors and um, yeah. Yeah, we're really talking about coloring your whole rest of your time at PSU, just kind of with that one interaction your first year. Um, I remember we also talked a little bit about like how that was a gift to you. And we talked about how it's also a gift to the giver as well. So I'm sure, you know, that that teacher got like a sense of um, like the same sense of relief almost. I can't, I mean, I can't speak for them, but I know I do when, when I have those experiences where I can tell a student like, yeah, you can miss your shift, it's fine. Or when I tell a student like, um, you know, you've missed all these assignments, but I'm gonna help you talk to your teacher about it and I'm gonna advocate for you. Like there's, we talked about it before, but there's something so healing and um, it just like, I don't know, I don't wanna sound cheesy, but it just like fills your heart with such joy to be able to do that for someone else. Um, yeah. Cassidy, do you want, uh, we are almost out of time. So I'm gonna invite Cassidy to kind of close us out and um, wrap this up for us. All right. So this kind of um, predates college a little bit, um, but I grew up like struggling with anxiety, and, like from the time I was super, super young. So I'd go into school and I'd have panic attacks. I wouldn't be able to finish work. I'd freeze. Um, and I was really, really scared to ask for help. Um, and because I was struggling, they wanted to figure out why, except no one ever like pulled me aside to ask me, you know, hey, what's going on? Um, so eventually I was diagnosed with ADD. Um, so I went about school with this label now attached to my name and every teacher who knew about that label would make assumptions on how to teach me based off that label. And the biggest thing was how do we get her to pay attention? So it was cold calling. A lot of it was honestly humiliating things I'm not even going to talk about because um, that's just a whole different, that's, yeah. Um, but every time I walked into a classroom for the longest time, I was just filled with like anxiety and dread. Um, but eventually it gets better, it's okay. <laughs> um, in high school, something that happened was um, I'd been talking to a friend about it. And by this time I found like a label for it. Cause when you're a kid, you don't have a label for it. Um, and the teacher overheard me, which is not what I wanted. Um, but he was very good about it. He finished a class as if nothing happened. Um, and then I believe we we're doing, or he finished a lecture. Um, we were doing individual work and he approached me and he asked me if I was okay. And of course, like, I was like, eh, I'm fine. He's like, no, you're not. Um, but I was shocked because it was the first time in education that anyone had ever really come up to me sincerely and asked me what was going on. Um, and for the rest of that semester, he made sure to check like if I was doing okay, he allowed me the space um, I needed to do my work. He um, helped me work through a couple aspects of the classroom that caused me stress. Um, and he really kind of changed my whole perception of how education could be. Um, I'm very fortunate to say that in Plymouth, I've had really fantastic professors, um, several who've caught on to me and my anxiety, um, and who have met with me and been like, hey, what's going on? How can I help you? And it's made the world of a difference. So sometimes just asking a student and not making assumptions about what's going on with them, kind of what um, Natalie was saying, just asking, getting a conversation, going, meeting with them, seeing what you can do for them uh, really, really helps. I think that's a wonderful last couple words. Thank you so much to Cassidy, Shelby, and Nat. Um, I have a lot to think about, uh, you know, based on all of this stuff. And I think there are so many opportunities for the collab to continue to offer some stuff to dive more into these topics about transparency and reciprocity and, um, you know, pedagogical like classroom trauma and the baggage that we all bring into the classroom. Um, but I am just so thankful to our students um, for coming 
with open hearts and honesty and talking about some of these, I mean, really hard experiences that you've had. Um, I so appreciate it. Thank you guys. And thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to um, stick around. Um, I don't know if our students can stick around, but I'm going to stop the recording and um, feel free to head out or chat or whatever you'd like. <laughs>